And we now come to the annual oration. And this year, we're delighted to have Dr. Gerard Ingham from Springs Medical Centre, winner of the Victorian General Practice of the Year, give our oration. Thank you. Well, um, it's a great honour to be asked uh, to come and give this oration. Uh, what started out when I was on the Victorian faculty uh, many years ago, we thought maybe we'll start an event and just speaking before to Michael about, we think there was about 20 or 30 at the first event which happened. So wonderful thing to be here and see so many and welcome to you. Congratulations on fellowship. It was a great honour when, um, uh, when I was asked by Cameron to give this talk and then he told me the topic, it was excellence and remarkableness. And uh, thanks a lot, Cameron, I thought. Um, though I must have to say that he certainly did an excellent and remarkable job with his pronunciations today. Uh, so yes, I did feel a bit like uh, Brian uh, from the life of Brian. You know, why are you looking at me talking about excellence and remarkableness? And then I realised, of course, was that you are the excellent and remarkable ones. And many of you have had much more amazing and remarkable journeys than me. Many of you coming from other countries and other cultures. And, uh, and you know, I, I personally have, I'm born in Australia and I've come from an academic family. I think I've had a relatively easy and way less remarkable path than many of you. And we could just sit around and talk about your remarkable stories. But hey, I'm the person up here with the microphone, so you get to have to hear mine. But I wanted to share with you um, some of the remarkable things that I've learned about general practice, because you've all today been um, accepted as competent GPs, whereas in fact the challenge to you now is to go from being competent GPs to being masters of general practice. And I hope that maybe I can share with you some ideas to help you achieve that transition, something I'm still trying to work on myself. Um, the first thing is to show you this picture of this person who you should all know, the most remark internationally would be accepted as the most remarkable primary care physician there's ever been, the late Barbara, Dr. Barbara Starfield. Now, she was the person who, uh, through her research and her, her colleagues, proved a whole lot of things about primary care. She proved all these things. She looked at her own country and wondered why it is that in the US it spends so much money on primary care when you know, generally with the more money you spend, the better the health outcomes. But in the US that's not the case. And there are two reasons for this. One is the greater the inequality between, the difference between rich and poor, the greater the inequality in society, the worse the outcomes. And then also, if your health system isn't a prime, based on primary care, then you have worse health outcomes when you look internationally. She even looked in her own country, and this graph shows the 50 US states. And you can see in the 50 US states, as you plot them, the uh, life expectancy against the, the number of primary care physicians, you can see that as the primary care physicians increase, that the uh, life expectancy increases. So yeah, we just make people live longer, us GPs. And you might think, oh, that's just because there's more doctors. But no, that's not the case. In fact, when you look at specialists, um, the more specialists are, the quality of life decreases. <laughs> So this is the 50 US states. So you know, this is very strong evidence for our profession. And you might wonder why it is. Well, of course, the more specialists act outside of their area, the more stuff ups they make. Um, so you need to know the evidence, the science behind our, our, um, our specialty. And there's going to be an increasing demand. I mean, talking to Natalia before about you know, the future, I'm trying to, discussing the, the changes that have happened in my 30 years as a GP have been enormous, but what's coming going forward? But in fact, I actually see a very bright future for general practice. We are, after all, the experts of multimorbidity and of juggling resources, and there'll be more and more of that that needs to happen. So you are not just a GP. So that's a remarkable story about general practice. I just want to share with you some other remarkable things and opportunities you have going forward. One of them might be to join a committee. Now, that's probably not the most exciting thing. Um, as you can see in that cartoon, it says, individually, we, we could do nothing. So we formed a committee which determined nothing could be done. Uh, I've been on a lot of committees and started with small hospital committees. And you know, I'm still the treasurer of the local tennis club and lots of committees. But now I find myself, through that progression, being on more important committees. 
I'm on the MBS task force review, which is reviewing uh, the, the uh, MBS schedule. And through that, uh, one of the things that came up was there was a strong push to change the referral rules that um, they, specialists said, why should specialist to specialist referral only be for three months? Why can't it be for longer? And the consumers were very keen on this as well. You know, between why couldn't the oncologist refer to the radiation oncologist for 12 months and not bother going back to the GP? And I was charged by the, the chair of this task force. He said, well, what's the evidence for general practice? So I Barbara Starfielded him. Yeah, and so that's the reason. There's, there are three GPs on that. There are three GPs on that committee, and the three GPs advocated very strongly for no change to the referral rules, and that's the reason. So you can do some very powerful work. Also, I would like to. I'm the GP who championed the change to the aftercare rules. You may not know, but previously you couldn't bill for aftercare after you saw someone who was sent back by a specialist. I'm the one who changed that, so I'll be taking a little collection from you <laughs> later. I can share my banking details. Um, I'm also, I was also on the committee that looked at urgent after-hours services, and you may be aware there was a proliferation of after-hours services, and so we changed the rules because that was effectively being a de facto after-hours uh, primary care service not being run by GPs, so we've changed that. But other committees I've been involved with, I'm just as proud of, I was involved with uh, Joe Flynn on the review of the ambulance services in Victoria. And, and if one of you starts to get a bit overwhelmed uh, later and you know, collapses, the chances of an ambulance arriving here on time uh, are much greater because of the work of that committee. We looked at changing um, the rules about when ambulances left, you know, what was coded as a lights and sirens, and by re reducing some of the things which weren't urgent, we were able to make um, a change there. So now, I mean, I, I read the figures that last year 27 extra people survived a cardiac arrest than the year before, and that's just from work on a committee. So committee work is worthwhile doing, let alone you know, all the work that could be done through the, uh, through the college committees. There's plenty of work to be done there, for sure. Another th remarkable opportunity for you is in teaching. Uh, I'm, uh, I, in my practice and the, the other supervisors in my practice, we counted up the other day, and between us, we've supervised over 100 GP registrars. And I'm very pleased to see one of them, Matthew Pilkington, here. Well done, Matt. Congratulations to you, my friend a remarkable GP he will be. And it's through him and, and through all of you that we know that we influence eternity. It's a wonderful thought. I also took the opportunity in, through my career to undertake some further learning and studied health professional education. And through that, got to publish my first article in the AFP, as it was then, about the life of a, a GP supervisor, when I discovered that there wasn't much, hadn't been much work done on how you should supervise during a consulting day and this led to a training module, which many of your supervisors would have undertaken, about how to, how to uh, clinically supervise. But um, I, hopefully they followed some of the things that I shared with them. And then this led on to research. And hey, wasn't it a fantastic research idea? We just heard virtual reality for immunisation. I've been involved in research now, and there are so many opportunities for research. Um, I was just thinking the other day when I prescribed some antihistamines for an insect bite. Oh, I went and quickly wondered, gee, what's the evidence for that? No study, and something you do all, all the time. So there are plenty of opportunities. Currently, my research projects include looking at the safety of early general practice training. So I've been asking uh, focus groups of registrars and supervisors about how can we make early general practice safer? Would it be useful for you to have a list of high-risk activities for which you knew you had to call your supervisor? There were opportunities, which maybe not so much for you, which was develop a business. It's a lot harder today. Here you can see back in those days when I was a bit younger, uh, two GPs and their partners could start a general practice um, uh, and convert a little house and start a general practice. It just turned recently into an Indian restaurant. <laughs> um, very good food. Well, I can't eat in my old consulting room, I can tell you. There it is behind the window. Um, but these days, that's where I work in a purpose-built facility, which was awarded as we were greatly honoured to be RACGB Practice of the Year for Victoria. Um, and it's a multidisciplinary clinic. We're here for you. And uh, I can't, if there's all these doctors out here, if any of you want a job, please come and see me afterwards as well. <laughs> um, plenty of work. Uh, but I've also learned some other things along the way that it's possible to be remarkably stupid. Um, uh, if you look at that graph um, there that shows, that's actually a graph from a study called, titled Extraneous Factors in Judicial Decision Making. 
and it looks at they had judges in Israel who were making decisions about parole um, and they looked they studied to say what were the factors which made it most likely whether someone was going to get parole or not and they looked at the nature of the crime the gender the, a whole lot of things and they found that the most likely thing which was going to affect whether someone was going to get parole or not was according to this graph was this place in the day where the person was seen you can see there where the circles are that's the start of each session the first one with a, a bit above 0.6 is the chance of your parole if you were the first person seen for the day. And you can see it rapidly declines. If you were the last person before morning tea, you never got parole. And, and the same again after morning tea, and you'll notice that after lunch it plummeted away very, very quickly. And although we sort of giggle and smile at that, it is something to reflect upon quite seriously. And if you work too hard, if you don't schedule the right amount of breaks in your day, you will practice poorly. Okay, it's a very important lesson to learn. The other important lesson to learn is actually from the guy there uh, on, on the left, uh, Greg Melker, who's been my colleague and partner for all these years and every week we sit down on a Friday night and have a cup of tea. Uh, not a beer but a cup of tea and we talk about the week and the experience and I'd encourage you all to have a mentor. I've been incredibly fortunate. It makes me emotional even talking about him. Um, you can be remarkably stupid and end up seeing me here. I actually also work as a Deputy Director for Professional Services Review, the Medicare Tribunal. And this is where you end up if you start to believe some of the things that other people tell you that it's okay to do with Medicare. Um, yeah, things that you might see on GPDU, Karen, but um, you don't believe everything just because one colleague told you. Anything that you do must be acceptable to the general body of general practitioners. So don't see me there. This is me on my couch, my old favourite couch. Um, this couch, I, when I took over in my practice, I took over from a 70-year-old GP. Um, and when he retired, Dr Peter Harper, he left me his couch and I used that and there it is, it just got put out into the backyard uh, last year. I finally decided that it wasn't exactly disabled, access friendly and it needed to go. Um, but it did make me reflect that I've been a GP there for 30 years and I see patients who are 70 years of age and they've only had two GPs. Pretty amazing. And we know all the evidence. That's what I said, the Barbara Starfield evidence. It's, it's not, you know, it's not the, uh, the medications or the tests that you order, it's you. Uh, you are the ones who bring the healing. You are the ones that sit and listen with people through their troubled times. And the value of that is just cannot be underestimated. And when it, I mentioned before that um, the competency, you are now competent GPs, to become masters of GPs, you, know, you, you need to progress. You need to spend more time with your patients and learn from them. Um, uh, and I want to share with you uh, another little story, which is the story of you don't have to stop being creative when you're a GP as well. I met uh, Dr Genevieve Yates when I was part of uh, Australia's only 12-person all-GP cover band, um, Simon and the G-Pets, and we wrote a musical about general practice. We originally premiered at 2013 at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, and here's some photos and posters from when we were at, the, uh, at NIDA last year, and we did our show there. And you can see from the map that the GPs come from all around the country. <coughs> and so I'm going to share with you um, a little a video in which you're all going to be required to sing along. And it's actually the finale of GP the Musical. Uh, the words will appear on the screen, and apparently if you're not singing, um, Harry will be taking away your fellowship on the way out. So, <laughs> so when the time comes, you've got to sing. Um, and just when you see this, the, the, um, the performance, you'll notice that uh, it does refer, as, the, as your oath does, to care and science. And I don't know if you're aware, but that's actually the... The motto, the Latin motto of the RACGP, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, is roughly translated as with care and with science. And for you to become, to go from being competent GPs to being masterful GPs, you have to figure that out to combine the care and the science. So here we go.
Thank you, Jared. That was a remarkable oration, sharing many of the opportunities you've had and also giving us some inspiration about opportunities that we as new fellows can all have in the future. So thank you.